so let's start by recalling that continuous Fourier transform. So the integral of our time domain function ft and related to this the inverse transform so ft here it comes to factor 1 over 2 pi integrating over capital F, so the transform now the first example I want to talk about is the, the delta function in the time domain let's put that up here so we're going to transform into the frequency domain integral from minus infinity to infinity of the delta function of t exponent j minus minus j omega t dt does anybody have an idea for what is going to happen with this integral particularly the role of the delta function sifting yeah so the sifting property means that we're simply going to have um, the value of what's in the integral at zero. And the integration variable is, sorry, is t. So instead of t, we're going to have zero. And what does that come out to? Exactly. So let's think about this for a second. We're transforming the time domain function of the, the Dirac delta to the frequency domain, and we have a constant function. So we have an equal amount of all different frequencies of sinusoids in there. Um, a way to think about that is that imagine a, a cosine, and you have your, your one peak around 0 and all the other peaks in other places. And as you add cosines of, of other frequencies, they won't line up away from zero, but they'll all have their peak at zero. So that's where you'll, you'll get your infinitely high peak. <coughs> now let's look at the delta function again, but in the frequency domain. And we'll transform back into the time. So f of t. delta omega this time now you I noted the similarity in these two transforms last time um, but you can see here that I'm sorry there's a factor 1 over 2 pi the factor is different here and there is a um, no longer the minus sign in the exponent however the delta function is even, so it's the same for positive or, or negative arguments. So we can really um, forget about the minus sign, and we just end up with the 1 over 2 pi. Now there is a, um, first of all, let's, let's think about this one in turn. So the, the delta function in the frequency domain, meaning um, you only have frequency zero, translates to a constant in the time domain. And what that is, is a DC component. So it's the same as having an A naught in your Fourier series. It's simply a constant offset. Um, I want to make a small note based on this. So here we transformed from frequency domain to the time domain. Now let's write it down the other way, but for the same function. 
So we're going to have d of omega. is our frequency domain function. So it must be equal to the integral of our time domain function, so 1 over 2 pi. times the exponent with the negative exponential. Exponential with the negative exponent, sorry. Right here. Now let's put this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So for the inverse Fourier, uh -huh. uh, why is it dt and not d omega? Um, it is d omega. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The reason I wanted to make that note is because the last example I want to look at is a cosine. And the omega naught here um, is a different thing from omega. It's a simply the one frequency that's, that the cosine has. So this is a time domain function. And before we transform it, I'll take it to a different form. And you know how with the Euler relation, you can relate cosines and sines to complex exponentials. And the cosine particularly comes to the sum of two exponentials. Um, if you're not sure about how this comes out of the Euler relation, you can look it up in the book. I don't want to waste too much time on it right now. Um, and now let's try to transform this into the frequency domain. Um, So going from minus infinity to infinity. Simply putting in this expression for the cosine. And then adding the exponential that comes from the, from the transform. Now, uh, the multiplications of the exponentials, you can write as single exponentials. So this is going to become the same integral with two exponentials. However, these are exactly what we have here. So, which means we know how to evaluate this. Um, so we know that a delta function of omega is what you get from making this integral when you have omega here in the argument. And each of these is simply going to be the same thing except substituting omega by omega plus or minus omega naught. So what that means is that we're going to have, um, let's go here, so we have our two, so the pi we need to pull to this side, then we're going to have our delta. But now, of omega plus omega naught, and the other term 
you have a question? Or? Okay. Um, so what happened here is that we started with a cosine in the time domain, and we ended up with the sum of two delta functions. So first let me pull up what that looks like. So you guys all learned about power spectrum the other day, right? Um, so who can tell me what, what is a power spectrum good for? Why would you use it? Yeah, look at frequency bands. Um, so that is well and good and is very handy, uh, but there are some issues with just your basic power spectrum. So does anyone know what issues there are? <laughs> Could be, yeah. Um, I mean, who here has ever like used a power spectrum for anything or seen one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, there are two main issues when you talk about power spectra. First one, I'm gonna attempt to draw here. Got two main issues. All right, so let's say that this is your frequency and this is power. Um, so one of the main issues is that let's say that you have a noisy cosine, right? And you go and you're plotting this because of the noise. You're going to also have variability in your actual power spectrum. And the other issue that you're going to have is what we say is leakage. So you're going to have something that looks like this. So does anyone know why you would have leakage? No? No guesses? Um, so leakage across the frequencies is because you're really only looking at one finite section of the signal. So this is a window, right? You're just looking at a window in time. Um, <coughs> and so pretty much what you're seeing is just based off of the spectral properties of your window. And so if you have different sized windows, you're going to have more or less leakage. So here, I had to find my excuse to use different colored chalk here. So let's say we have an example and we have three different sized windows here, okay? If we were to actually plot a power spectrum for all these different sections of this uh, cosine wave, what you end up with are variations in what you're actually seeing. So for this really big box, right, the wider the window, um, the more ripples and the higher amplitude you're going to see. So you actually end up with something that looks like Whereas um, if you have this slightly smaller box, which let's say it's half, sorry, I did not do the best job drawing that, you'd see something that looks a little bit more like And lastly, you would get something that's more like hmm. So obviously, those are three very, very different things if you're looking at this. So windows make a huge difference in how you're viewing and looking at your power spectrum analysis. Um, and so to sort of look at that in terms of the more mathematical side of things, let's do an example. Does that work? We're going to base it off of, we're going to say that's a cosine function. We're going to base it off of that. Um, and in essence, in this case, what we're doing is what's considered a rectangular window. So pretty much we're going along and 
we say, you know, this is zero. This is the part we cut out. Um, and so there are other types of windows, and we'll get to that part and the idea of using many windows. But I guess first let's start with easy, basic, first idea. So as Albert so nicely set this up for me, we can now define a cosine function. in terms of delta functions. So did anyone, does anyone remember what we just wrote down for in the time domain, how you would define a cosine function in terms of delta, like impulse functions? Pi times the bracket delta of omega plus omega dot. And the same thing. Awesome. Fabulous. Um, so we're just going to let that hang out for a second, because first we need to define our window. Uh, and so for this, we are going to say that our window is WRT. Cool? Um, and the thing is, because we're dealing with a window, rather than, well, actually, let's do this first. So we want to put this into the frequency domain. So now we want WR J omega. So this one's obviously continuous, but because it's a window, we already know that we can say, uh, you know, this is one if we're between, you know, negative t over two and positive t over two, and everywhere else it's zero. Like we don't care about anything outside of that. So we can change this whole thing, and instead say that this is equal to. And so then, if we just take that one step further, you can actually take it out and you get your negative 1 over j omega. Um, and Take my word for this. If we go back to Euler's relationship and you switch in your sines and cosines and do the algebra, you can check this out in the book. Um, what you end up with is this whole thing equal to So that's what we have for our actual window, right? But what we actually care about is how does that relate to the cosine, right? That we had defined earlier. So now you guys, uh, do you guys still need these, these pictures or can I erase them? Can I erase them? Cool. There's <coughs> another example in the book, actually, just like that. So. Plenty of examples floating around. <laughs> All right. So now we've got our little thing over there, and we've defined cosine also in terms of the time domain. So you guys don't know about convolution yet. But you will, and so you, yet again, you're just going to have to take my word for it, that multiplying the cosine 
and our fun little window is the same as complex convolution in the frequency domain. So next week, this will all make more sense. But in the meantime, just roll with it, OK? Uh, so if we kind of define that and use our fun little sifting property, then what you kind of end up with is here. Say, Uh, omega and then ju. So I'm going to define it in terms of u this time. Okay. Which one? Yeah, the u. Sorry. Um, it's just another way of okay. writing it out. Um, so like it'll be du instead of dt. Okay. Uh, I did not leave myself enough space. OK, we're just going to do this. So if you define that whole thing, and then if we actually put in the things that we defined earlier, what you actually end up with is a combined equation. And so do all the math, you get Because we can redefine these as t over a half, or t over 2, right? Remember how we said it's a discrete window? So instead of being continuous, we can put it into discrete windows here. Um, All right, I think I got all the plus and minus signs worked out there. So in essence, you end up with this equation. And this is how you end up with those ripples. So this all goes back to that whole idea that we were saying that you get this leakage, right? Um, and one of the ways to combat this leakage is that, oh, well, you can define different windows. Kind of how I showed you if we had a bigger window, we ended up with more ripples. If we had a smaller window, less ripples. But the downside to these are obviously that you're changing the amplitudes and things. So we can use different windows, not, yeah. What's the R subscript on the screen? Oh, it just meant for like the rectangular window. This window happens to be a rectangle. And so I just put an R so we knew what type of window you're dealing with. Um, <coughs> but in order to reduce these ripples, you can use other fancier non-rectangular windows, which is very exciting. But the problem is they also are going to attenuate the peak of the amplitude and increase the width. So how do we get across this issue? Because obviously now we have different ways if we use these other windows to reduce the leakage. But that doesn't actually help us with variance, which was the other issue we were talking about, right? Because if you have a noisy signal, you're going to have a lot of noise. So what's one way that you can reduce noise in a signal mathematically? Average. Yes, average. Um, and so obviously we have two options in terms of averaging, right? We can either average in the time domain, so take multiple epochs, which 
is well and good, except if you have a non-stationary signal. And so if your signal is dynamic, that's going to be a really big problem. Um, or you can average in the frequency domain. But the problem with that is you're losing resolution, right? So this brings us to the idea of a multi-taper solution. So tapers and windows are the same thing. I do not know who decided that they should use both names all the time, but it's the same idea. <laughs> and so if one window helps you to reduce the leakage, then obviously many windows would help you to reduce the leakage even more. And if you have many windows, you can average, right? So you're combating both problems at once. Um, and so when I say that you have multiple tapers, what we're talking about here is that each of these tapers is slightly different, and they're all orthogonal to you, one another. So in essence, you have a power spectrum for every single taper. Does that make sense? Yeah, sort of. So like here. We don't need this anymore. We use our nice multi-taper way of thinking about things. In essence, what you're going to end up with is a power spectra for every single taper. And so we have k numbers of tapers, right? And so for all of those, what you can end up with in the end is this average <coughs> power spectrum, which is based off of the number of tapers. And so you take your k from 1 to big K, you have your s of k, f. So you have all your different tapers. Um, and in essence, you're just defining your tapers. And so you want your tapers to all be um, orthogonal to one another, and you want them to all be normalized, right? Because you want everything to sort of sit nicely and not be messing around with everything. Uh, so what type of tapers do you think would be best? Obviously, you want multiple ones, but what are some of the distinguishing features of these tapers that you think would be important? Any guesses? I mean, uh, if I were doing this, I obviously would want tapers that don't have a whole lot of activity outside of the band of interest, right? So you don't want a whole lot of side lobe ripple effects. Um, and you want low amplitude spectral values. So that, in other words, an, another way of saying that is you don't want a whole lot of spectral values outside of your, your frequency band that you're actually looking at. So how do we do that? How do we minimize the leakage? Luckily, there's a handy dandy formula to help you with this. <laughs> All right, so we have lambda. And lambda, in this case, is the actual like taper's energy within a specific frequency band. So here we're going to say that this is lambda in terms of n and w. So we want specifically to look at this. This is the bandwidth w, OK? And n is the number of points in the total spectrum. So far, so good. Um, and so obviously, if we wanted to find the amount of energy for this taper, what we can do is look at U to W of. So in this case, the A, the A of F here, this is the actual, we're defining the taper, okay? So A is the actual um, taper's equation. And 
frequency band. Um, so we wanted to find this is our bandwidth of interest over Who knows why I put, well, that's supposed to be a half. Why is there a negative half to a half here? Well, why halves? What else is a half when you think about frequencies? What, so if you're recording something, right? Um, how many frequencies can you actually like? Record. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we really only have a band that can go from negative half to a half because those are the only ones you can define. Um, so we want to find a taper that has maximum amount of energy in this band W, right? <coughs> so how do we maximize this? So lambda represents the energy. Anyway, so we want to maximize lambda. What's the simplest way to do that? Huh? Yes, and set it equal to 0, right? Woohoo, yay. So if you take the derivative and you set it equal to 0, something very fun happens. Um, maybe it's only fun if you've done linear algebra, but <laughs> what you end up with, um, and this is all the appendix of the handout. Did you guys actually get the handout that Wim sent out? Okay. Uh, I will work on that, and we will have the handout sent out. Do you have access to the handout? Okay. Well, so... All of this is from a handout. It's called multi-taper power spectrum estimation. Uh, your homework's in it, so I recommend finding it. <laughs> so anyway, if you take the derivative and you set it equal to 0, what you end up with is And in this case, we can define D to be, let me see, what's the easiest way to do this? I guess this way. So D is a matrix, an n by n symmetric matrix. Specifically, hang on one second. There we go. OK, so you have your nice n by n symmetric matrix, which uh, if you wanted another way to think of it, this is pretty much the covariance matrix for the inverse transform of the window, that rectangular window we were talking about, which I realize is a lot of stuff, a lot of words I just threw at you. Um, so pretty much just, it's a matrix. And we're going to use this matrix to maximize our lambda. And in this case, does anyone know what this is? Yeah, exactly. So you can get eigenvalues and eigenvectors out of it, right? Uh, yeah. Um, so A, I guess the other way I could actually just write A would be V. A is vectors. You know, like if you have your basic matrix eigenvalue problem. Um, I just was using the nomenclature from the actual packet. So I'm going to leave the A's so that you guys can actually use your notes with the packet. But in essence, if you were to solve this, this gives you your 
And so you can have all your And A or V or whatever you want to call it is your eigenvectors. So they all correspond. And here, we'll just say that it's, I'll use A's to make life easy. So now we have our eigenvalues and eigenvectors. If you guys don't know how to solve these, that's OK. I'm pretty sure the homework does not require you to. Um, but what you can do is use these eigenvalues and eigenvectors to help you figure out which tapers to use. So in essence, you're defining your tapers. Um, does anyone in here know what principal components analysis is? Yeah? Who can, who can give a definition for those that don't know? Like, how does it work? What, it, what is the point of it? What does it do? I'll take a stab at yeah, go for it. I mean, no pressure. This is. of a way to like optimize, right? Yeah. And so another way you could sort of think about these sets of eigenvalues and eigenvectors here is it's, it's principal components analysis, right? So here we're optimizing the tapers. Which of the tapers are the best? So obviously the first one is going to have the least amount of extra noise and ripples and whatnot, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like principal components analysis of, I guess, the inverse transform of the ideal spectral window, which is a lot of words to pretty much just say that you're going to have this list, and the first one's going to be best, and then consequently, they get more and more noisy, or more and more leakage, right? Um, and so obviously, first one's going to be really good. And the question is, how many do we use? Because you sort of need to side, right? That's a lot of tapers you could apply. Um, and so a pretty good rule of thumb to start off with is to think of it as, let me see, here. Good rule of thumb, right? N was the number of points in your power spectrum, W is your band, um, your bandwidth. You know, and so 2 and w minus 1, that's a nice general number, you know. Uh, it's a good place to start, because more than that, and you start getting too much bias on the end, so you get too much leakage. Um, so even though you're reducing the variance, right, because you can average across all of these tapers, you're not necessarily helping after a certain point. You're hurting. <coughs> um, but. That, even that number, is not necessarily like a perfect fit. So I guess the best way to show you that, explain that, is an example. So I'm going to pull down the screen. Come on, Ben. There we go. <laughs> Oh, cool. Um, so the example that's in the handout is one based on a paper that has used this whole method. <laughs> that didn't happen. I'm just going to stand now. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're just going to go with this is an equation that other people have used. And so Wim used an example from a paper that has used this method and sort of studied it. And so if you run the first code, and don't break the computer, <laughs> 
you should get this beautiful, perfect little power spectrum. So this is your frequency band. This is your power. Uh, I believe in this case it's in decibels. And so you guys see in general what this power spectrum is supposed to look like, right? So this is a theoretical ideal. Um, so I don't know how much of this you can see. It's in the handout. So when you guys get your handout, or if you want to go on chalk, maybe you guys can find it also on your own computers, um, since I guess it should be on there. But in essence, what this figure shows you is that they took um, an NW of 4. So that means that if we use our whole thing that says 2NW minus 1 is you know, an optimal number, uh, you should get 7, right? And so we have put up 8, because why not? We'll just show you what all of them look like. Uh, and in essence, what each one of these figure elements is, it shows you what the actual uh, window looks like, so, or the taper, right? So k equals 1 is your first taper, k equals 2 is your second taper, et cetera. Um, and then they multiplied that by the signal. Um, and so this is what that second one is is it shows you, OK, well, when I apply this taper, what do I get in terms of time domain? And then the third one is, what does the taper look like in the frequency domain? And so like as you can see here, right, k equals 1 doesn't have a whole lot of ripples or um, like side lobes. But as you get down to k equals 7 or 8, they're enormous, enormous side lobes. And so those aren't doing much for you. Um, and then if you actually look at the fit, Obviously, the first one fits very well onto this line. Uh, look at your own screens, since the gray doesn't show up here. Uh, but it's still very noisy. There's a lot of variance. And so progressively, the variance is reduced. But you can see that it's less of an ideal fit. And so even if you get to um, 7, which was our 2NW minus 1, it's far too much of um, too many tapers. Doesn't do a good job of fitting it anymore. So I would say that probably your best bet is k equals 5 in this case. And so 5 tapers is pretty good in this case. Um, and then if you actually go to the next figure, obviously each of those was an individual taper. And so we were just looking at, OK, well, how does the first one fit? How does the second one fit? But in the case of a multi-taper analysis, what you're actually doing is applying all of these average together. And so if we look at this second figure, what we can see is, yes, you know, the first figure still has the least amount of leakage, but it's still very noisy. But if we average that with the second and the third and the fourth, et cetera, we can see that it's not as bad as it is in that previous figure when you just have that one taper by itself. But um, you still can get to about k equals 5, and that's about as good as it's going to get. That being said, it isn't a bad fit, you know? <laughs> it could be worse. And it does compensate for a lot of those issues that you have if you just had that first single taper, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's all well and good. But obviously, we want to be efficient. And luckily, MATLAB has a lovely code that will do this all for you. Um, and so it's called PMTM, or I don't actually know what it stands for, something with multi-taper somethings. Um, but uh, the handout ha goes through all of the different elements. And it's very nice because you can actually adapt all of the different elements and sort of define what you want it to do. Uh, but just to show you how much better it is than your basic power spectrum, we can run the second half of this code. <laughs> So that's our theoretical figure. All right, so we have our theoretical. This black line is what I was showing you before. That's what this power spectra actually looks like in reality, right? Um, and so what we can see is that if you just do your basic rectangular window where you take out an epoch and you run your power spectral analysis, right? So just a single taper, also known as like a periodogram. Um, you get what this blue one shows. I don't know about you. In those higher frequencies, though, it's definitely not doing a very good job of sticking to what it's supposed to do. Um, and so instead, what you can see 
is that you get this lovely red multi-taper one. And so this is what you get if you actually use PMTM. Um, but sort of to explain a little bit more about why this whole thing came about, when I showed you those averaged figures in the PowerPoint here, right? they still weren't perfect. And obviously, we had said, oh, well, 2 and w minus 1 is a good number of tapers, right? And so we don't want to be missing out on possible applications of tapers that could be helping us out, right? So what would be another way to sort of adapt things so you could use all of them? Uh, so what about weights? Yeah? What do you guys think? <laughs> Is that a good idea? <laughs> yes, good answer. <laughs> um, so obviously, if you optimize the weights for all the tapers, then you can still use all of your tapers and get the benefits. It's the best of both worlds, right? <laughs> um, so there's two ways you can sort of weigh things. How would you, how would you weigh these tapers? Like, what's the, the simplest way you could think of? Huh? Linear combination. Yeah. Well, I mean, we already had this lovely stuff with our eigenvalues over here, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's not ideal, although it is a brilliant idea, and people suggested it. Um, and they tried that out, and they're like, hey, this is pretty cool. The idea of weights is great. And then they were like, actually, though, not with eigenvalues. So instead, they came up with this adaptive method. And so in essence, what they came up with is something that looks like this. By they, I mean this guy, Thompson, who came up with this whole method. Um, <laughs> All right, so this D is your weight. And what he actually decided is that it's frequency dependent. And so you can redefine dk of f to be Um, and this is the variance for your actual data function. So like x of t, in other words, you know, if you were just going to put it in terms of that. Um, and what was lambda again? Who remembers what lambda is? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so this helps you, and you can use this lovely adaptive filter. But does anyone see a problem with this equation for your weights. If lambda is really small, uh, or if it's a D in our denominator gets really big. Well, you wanted to maximize your lambda, so your lambda is going to be okay. But do you know this? I mean, isn't that what we're trying to, to solve for in the first place is 
in the end, you want to end up with a power spectrum. Um, and so you would think that would be a problem, but usually uh, they take, since you know that your first taper is going to be pretty, pretty good, right? It doesn't have a whole lot of side lobe leakage stuff. They'll work backwards, and so they'll use it for the initial estimate of your SF, and then work backwards and find the weights, which seems like a little counterintuitive. But apparently it works very well, because the MATLAB function does it, and we've seen that it does a nice job with it. <laughs> so um, this would be the best way to sort of apply as many tapers as you actually want and weigh them accordingly with your frequencies and everything. Uh, so why would you want this? Other than, like, we said we wanted to look at frequency bands. But what was that one thing that you noticed in, let me see if I still have this picture. Figure up. Yeah. So where do you really see the worst part of this estimation in this figure? High frequencies, yeah. So obviously, we're having a lot of trouble defining the high frequencies well. And so this is where multi-taper power spectral analysis comes in super handy. Um, so now we get to the fun part where I get to show you cool data of how this actually applies to the real world. Um, I guess we already said it doesn't work too well in the high frequencies, right? So this is from my actual data. Woohoo! Now we get to see real science. Um, <laughs> and as you can see here, so I'm interested in what we call like high frequency oscillations. And sp specifically, they fall into what's considered the high gamma range. So we're talking 80 to 150 hertz. Um, and people have suggested that activity in this range, in epileptic activity, like during epileptic activity, can be a really good way to localize where seizures are originally initiating for, so that you can go in during surge surgery and be like, oh, I see HFOs there, um, high frequency oscillations. Um, that must be the part we want to take out. And go, and you chop it out, and hooray, your patient has no more like seizures. Um, but if you notice, right, this is your regular power spectrum, this gray one. And the black one is if I apply this multi-taper method. Right? So you get this overestimation if you don't apply your multi-taper method. And so that's a huge problem because obviously you don't want to go in there and start chopping out pieces that don't need to come out. So we used our multi-taper analysis and did some really cool experiments. I think they're cool. If you don't agree, just you know, keep it to yourself. <laughs> Um, so one of the other, I guess, interesting things about epilepsy is the fact that, you know, you see these HFOs on a network scale when you're doing these recordings. And so when I say we're doing, like, recordings in humans, I mean ECOG scale. Um, and so you're recording from centimeters at a time. So we're talking millions of neurons here. So it's definitely a network activity. but. If you were to look at slices that show seizure-like activity and record from a single neuron, you actually see these things that are called PDSs. And so PDS is a proxismal depolarizing shift. And in essence, it's a neuron that starts bursting and firing. And then it hits a, a plateau, like a saturation point. So it levels off, and you lose some amplitude, and that comes back. Um, er, here, I'll draw it. Why not? <laughs> It's nice. <laughs> there, pretty pity, yes. So, what the question we asked was originally all right, well, can you relate these PDSs to high frequency oscillations? And so, we actually had slices from human tissue that had been resected, and we had an extracellular electrode and an intracellular electrode, and so. We looked at the activity that corresponded during, um, you know, here you have your intracellular PDSs, um, and here you have your extracellular bursts. And so if you look at your power spectrum, you will know there's a peak 
right in that band that we're interested in, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I guess this, I'll, I'll give you a clue. It is, there are high frequency oscillations in your little network, but then the bigger question, right? If you're recording from a million neurons at a time, how do you get from one scale to the other? Because obviously we're talking about itty bitty little networks in a slice. And in the brain, you've got a bunch of stuff going on. So we used the idea of volume conduction. So that's a linear, linear property. In other words, we're saying, all right, your frequencies are going to be the same, but we're just going to scale across different sizes of networks here. And so in order to do this, the way we looked at it was to say, all right, I'm going to take all these bursts in our activity, right? I'm going to pull them out. And I'm going to treat each one like it's its own little small network. Um, and if I lay them on top of each other, right, so superimpose them like this, and average it, then it's an estimation of what you would see at a bigger scale. Um, and so if I all superimpose all of them, it's synchronous activity, which is one of the qualifications that we thought was important for um, you know, epileptic activity right, to cross these scales. If you have frequencies in really, really small networks, how are you going to see it at a large network? And so during a seizure, things are pretty synchronous. So we're like, OK, cool. Well, maybe they're all synchronized small networks. Um, and the other option was to sort of randomly pick epochs of data and say, all right, you may or may not be in the middle of a seizure-like burst. Let's just superimpose all of those and see what happens. And so we have our you know, synchronous and asynchronous case. And we did the same for the, um, for the intracellular recordings. And then we actually have a collaborator who does really cool stuff where they take microelectrode arrays. So in essence, you get 96 electrodes for the price of one. Uh, it's the same size as an ECOG electrode, but with little spikelets sticking out that have been put in patients who are undergoing this resection surgery for epilepsy. And so that meant that we got you know, smaller networks again, as well as if you average that activity, it's the same as your ECOG electrode. So let's look at more power spectra graphs, maybe. So if we actually look at what the data shows us, what we found is that for the intracellular recordings, which is this line with the nice big peaks, you get a huge peak right in your 80 to 150 hertz band. And so that's pretty cool because that means that you really can start relating things that happen in a single neuron up across scales to things that people were seeing clinically, right? And it's definitely not there if you look at your baseline. Um, and it's also there in your extracellular recordings. Um, and what's like clutch to this story is we also had recordings where you didn't have PDSs. You just had more normal bursts, right? So they were just like burst. Um, and if you look at the intracellular recordings for a burst, which um, I guess if you look at physiological data with gamma oscillations and stuff, people are always like, oh, well, fast spiking neurons and bursting neurons show gamma oscillations, and they fire at about that frequency range. Um, and that's true. If you look at an intracellular recording, you're like, hey, look, there's a ton of high frequency activity. But if you look at the extracellular recordings, you drop, drop it by half. And so this really motivates this whole idea of it being something super pathological with these PDSs. And I don't have a good excuse for why PDSs are doing this yet. We're getting there. When I finish my dissertation, we'll know. <laughs> um, but this really plays into this idea then of, OK, well, we don't want to overestimate how much high frequency power we have, because obviously there's a difference, right? Because here's more physiological bursting. It still has high frequency activity, but not as much as the seizure-like activity. Um, so to tell you the rest of the story, I guess, um, if you look at the idea of synchrony, because now we want to cross scales, what we found is that if you superimpose these bursts, or I mean these PDSs, in a synchronous manner, you keep all of your high frequency activity, 
And the same with your extracellular recordings. You know, if you superimpose your bursts and then average them, you keep your high frequency activity. But if you randomize the data, you get something pretty much back at baseline. Um, and so this was super cool because we're like, wow, so it really could be much smaller networks that are just scaling up all across. Um, and we even put in a little estimation to see how much synchrony you actually needed. And so uh, do you guys know about jitter analysis at all, or the idea of jittering? So pretty much if you have your, your signal, right? Like let's say I have a bunch of these and I was going to superimpose them. Usually you'd want to put them right on top of each other. But if I jitter it, what I can do is say, OK, well, you can lay this other you know, PDS. Ooh, I should do this in pink. Hang on. Um, and it can go anyway shifted, so that when we shift them, we're adding a little bit of noise. And so the question is, how much noise can you add before you lose all of your power, right? And what we found is that it's, it's pretty tight, like within the first 5 to 10 milliseconds of shifting the data, right? So um, this is what we call like a jitter plot. And so pretty much we have a point for every amount of like shift possible. And within 10 milliseconds, you completely diminished all of the activity you had. So we're like, oh, wow, cool. So synchrony, woohoo! Synchrony leads to more power. But we care about what happens in humans. And so we actually went through. And like I told you, we have our windows. And windows can cause trouble, or they can be really useful. Um, and so I took recordings from actual seizures in these patients that I told you had the microelectrode arrays. And if you split up the seizure into little epochs and then run a power spectrum, and in this case, we're doing our multi-taper thing because we've established it's awesome. <laughs> um, you can look at how much high frequency power is happening in each of these little, little steps. And so these are all of your 96 electrodes. Um, I guess I should back up for a second. So when our collaborators did these recordings, what they didn't realize, and they stumbled upon later, was that even though they thought they were putting these electrodes in what's considered like the focus, so um, you know where the seizures are coming from is considered the focus. Sometimes they would hit in an area that they considered the core, so the area that seemed to really be generating the seizure and like where the spike activity related with the, the seizure-like activity that they were seeing. And sometimes they'd hit on an area that they called the penumbra, which is the surrounding area that didn't have a whole lot of spike activity, you know. It was kind of just hanging out. If you looked at it on a recording, it looked like it was having a seizure, but the actual neurons weren't recruited. And so a lot of times you could go from the core and it would get recruited into the, like the penumbra would get recruited in. But what's really cool is that the core shows a ton of high frequency activity. And the penumbra shows a little bit, but nowhere near as much. And so this really gives you a metric to sort of define that, oh, all right, well, this is the area that's really being generated and affected. And this is the area that we're just seeing it in. And so you could theoretically <laughs> um, take out less <laughs> tissue, because you obviously can now define between the two. Um, but until such a time when they are OK with us putting a bajillion of these crazy electrodes in patients, which I don't foresee anytime soon. Anita, you should get on that. <laughs> uh, we have to console ourselves with things that you can do at the ECOG level. And so I told you we averaged the activity from this microelectrode array. And so here you can sort of see when you average the activity from the microelectrode array, it's pretty similar to what you see on ECOG electrode. So this is. Uh, an ECOG electrode that was placed very close to where the MIA was. Um, and again, what's nice is that there's a ton of synchrony, it looks like, in the actual core. So you still have a bunch of your activity, high frequency activity that shows up. But when you average the activity 
in the penumbra recordings, all that little bit of red that we did have has completely disappeared. So it's obviously desynchronized. And we came up with a fun metric to show that. And so these white lines pretty much uh, correspond with the idea that there is synchrony. And so when we average it, we can see that there's still a, um, all right, let me back up. <laughs> so fun little synchrony metric. If you take a power spectra of a bunch of signals and you average them, the one thing that you're not accounting for at that point, right, because now you just have like, ooh, yeah, is phase, right? So they could all be doing the same thing and have the same frequencies going, but you don't know whether or not the activity is in phase or out of phase because there's no time component anymore, right? So if you average that, you pretty much get like your ideal amount of how much high frequency activity can you have. Um, but if you were to take all your signals, let's say you have a bunch of uh, seizures or seizure recordings, right? And then you average these, phase matters. Um, and so when you average those together and then take one power spectrum, you're going to get maybe a different amount of high frequency activity because you don't know whether things are in phase or out of phase and are going to annihilate each other or not. Um, and so we made a ratio. We're like, cool. Take the amount of high frequency power, if you do this, and divide it by the amount of high frequency power that's capable at all from the system. Uh, and what we found is that in the core, for a lot of these points in the middle of the seizure, you had a really significant amount of power, like this ratio was pretty high. So it was above 0.5, which means that you're saving a lot of that high frequency activity when you divide it out. And so, um, in other words, these are really, really synchronous. But in the penumbra, the activity that you did have, which was already pretty sad and minimal in the first place, um, probably because they don't have any neurons that are PDSing, uh, it all disappears. There's no synchrony. Um, and so this kind of is another added bonus of things that then a clinician can say, oh, OK, well, I see high frequency activity here, but also what does this tell me about synchrony and so can we adapt these methods? And it all comes back down to the fact that we can use these different tapers and without the multiple tapers, you know, who knows, I would be overestimating how much high frequency activity there is and then we'd be in a huge rut. <laughs> um, so that is one application for why you would want to use multi like multiple tapers.